Deborah, the, the armchair traveler, what you heard? Now, Deborah would like to know what, at what age does the size difference between male and female lion cubs become apparent? So anything from now, Deborah, from around six months onwards, you can start seeing the difference. Uh, the males also start to develop a little scraggly uh, sort of chin fluff. Okay, I've just got to be on the Game Drive channel quickly. Andrew is trying to find where we are. We're not visible from the road, so I'm just going to chat to him quickly. Oh, they're complaining again. <laughs> Andrew, um, I'm the only station here. You're more than welcome to join. Uh, if you come on Triple M, almost directly opposite uh, One Eye Pan, you'll see the tracks going east into the block. Byron saw this morning at around Philemon's Dip Junction with Zoe's Road. Sorry about that. Just letting Andrew know. Now it's very important to stay in communication with all the other vehicles. Now it's the best way for all of us to find the best sightings. So Aubrey found these lines this morning and uh, we have to thank him for that. And it does go through stages where Everyone's or each individual seems to find more than the other, but it all evens out over time because we all share our sightings. Now the sun is coming out, which means as the sun moves higher in the sky, some of the lions might end up in the sun and it could cause them to move slightly. But as I said, I don't think they're going to move too far today. I think unless something stumbles onto them for breakfast, I think they're probably going to be sleeping in this area for the majority of the day. Dinga is wondering what are the trees they're lying under. Well, I'm not sure what that little cub's up to because he's going into the middle of a bush. Uh, the bush that he is, or she is, I can't see, um, disappearing into is a, a white berry bush. And I don't know what could be that interesting that you want to go all the way inside there. Uh, maybe thinks it might have some respite from the biting flies. And the one closest to us, that's in between, this one that's in between us and the and the lion cub, is called a weeping wattle. There he is. Maybe he's found a fly-free spot in the thicket. Now, the rest of the trees, as we head off slightly to the right, and those bigger ones there are gory bushes. No, no, those are those are those. Those are not quarry bushes, the ones to the left, sorry. That one there is a quarry bush. And the one that Khat was showing to the right is a bush willow. So even though it was stormy and rainy last night, uh, it is still quite warm, still humid. And I wonder if that means we're going to get any more rain later in the day, especially if it builds up again with this heat and humidity. Oh, 
heavy eyelids. Now, if any of you at home like sleeping, then if you ever come back as an animal, you want to be a lion, because they sleep for about 20 hours a day. And even those four hours of activity are generally in short bursts, active for 10 or 20 minutes or even 40 minutes, then sleep for an hour, active again for half an hour, sleep for 20 minutes. And a lot of their movement depends on how full they are. Looks like she might have heard something in the bush to the west of us. Nothing too interesting, not enough to make her stand up and go investigate. Very peaceful in Gouma sighting this morning. Everyone relaxing. But the amazing thing is you never know. Oh, look at that. Well, fast asleep. Oh, the flies after the rain could be quite a pro well, not a problem, but irritating for the lions. Hi Lucy. Lucy's wondering about that floppy ear. Will it affect the hearing? Probably a little bit Lucy, but uh, not too much as you can see. It can still move the ear. There's still some cartilage in it. Oh, some wonderful bird calls around. I'm just going to move forward a little bit. Yeah, here we go. So, behind us, on the opposite side of the lions. Okay, let's just see where it's flicked to now. Murphy's, oh, there it is. Oh, and there it's gone. Oh dear, well, it's disappeared. Uh, and on that note, uh, we're gonna go back to Steph and see how their tracking is going. Talking about birds, this is forming such an important meal for the birds at the moment. This is the white berry bush and I know we speak about it from time to time on Bushwalk but it's only because they provide you with a tasty snack while, while you're wandering through the bush like we are. Mmm, that is good. They're starting to get much riper now, literally by the day. You're finding bushes with some ripe ones on. They're ripe when they are white. When they're slightly green like those ones that you're looking at right now, they've got a, a, a bittery taste to them. Not quite bad, but the second they go white, they get very sweet. Here's, a, here's one that's white. That's about as ripe as they get. And then you can just pile them in. Another quite fresh plant out here is, is this. This is a, a apple leaf tree and I love picking the leaves of apple leaf trees. They've just got such a refreshing sound. I quite enjoy green apples and it gets this name from the crunch that the leaf makes when you, you crunch it. Let's see if I can put it next to my microphone for you and show you. Oh, hang on. That wasn't a dry one. That was too fresh. <laughs> Epic fail. Let me find you a fresh one. There's a bit of a better one, I think. Let's see if this one will work. No, still not dry. Too wet, too much rain. What's happening to me today? No, not working today. Leaves are too new and it's been too much rain. Oh, anyway, let's go on going, <laughs> try and recover some of my lost pride after that. Mm. We're getting into some parkland now, which is quite, it's quite pleasant to walk through these areas. This particular area of Juma, we're, we're in the center of Juma really. And 
this parkland that you see is, is by design almost. The elephants have knocked down a lot of the big trees. And as we approach the seep line, it becomes more and more difficult for the trees to take root again because of the high water content that's lying quite close to the surface here. And so you get these grasslands that develop underneath these trees and the trees are quite widely spaced from one another and it just it just gives this very nice open area to walk through and it's just nice you don't have to worry about what buffalo is going to be jumping out of a bush at you or what elephant herd is hidden by a thicket sammy soccer walking around over here i suppose this is where this question came from. You've asked, do we have poison ivy around here? Sammy Soccer, we don't have poison ivy, no, but we do have a fire weed. Um, although it's this particular fire weed that grows here is um, is uh, is a vine that grows around trees close to drainage lines. So every now and again, you walk past a piece of fire weed and it has these hairs on it with some toxins coating it. That is unbelievably painful. It feels like somebody's taken acid and poured it on your skin. But um, we don't have these thickets of poison ivy here, not at all. This is a blackjack. And at this particular, at this particular size, you can boil this in some water and the leaves make for quite a nutritious vegetable. So not like a tuber, it's not going to give you a lot of carbohydrates, but it just is a nice addition to your diet. It's got this very pleasant peppery smell. Um, Almost like a rocket, I would, I would imagine. So this you could sprinkle over your salad, no problem. Oh, it would add a nice taste to it as well. They're better when you cook them. Doesn't have an unpleasant taste at all. Very similar to rocket. Not as peppery the taste. But not unpleasant. I wouldn't mind it sprinkled though lightly over a salad myself. Alright, let's carry on going. Let's see what is happening over here. Just make it easy for VM to come through here without getting all tied up. Mm. It's a nice day today. It's overcast, wind is blowing a bit. thought this was a plant that it isn't. This is one of the weeds. It gets a big fleshy purple flower with a yellow back. I'll see if I can find you one. All right and on that note and while we carry on trying to find some breakfast snacks for you, I'm going to send you over to Byron all the way in Arethusa. No, we carried on driving around Arethusa. No sign of the secretary birds or jackals that we were looking for on the on the airstrip on the clearings. Um, we had one impala alarm calling, but it was alarm calling at us. So <laughs> we're probably going to move out of this area now. Go back past the airstrip. Just see, but it does seem to be fairly quiet here this morning. But you never know, just like last night, driving around, you bump into things all the time, and it could be a leopard or it could be anything for that matter. And still a lovely, lo a very, very beautiful morning. The air is so clear because of that rain that we had last night. And um, the cloud cover, there's a bit of cloud cover around, but the sun is shining and uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful morning. Very, very peaceful. You can hear some woodland kingfishers calling in the distance. It's a little bit too far. I don't think you'd be able to hear it, unfortunately. That wonderful <laughs> beautiful sound. Uh, 
Um, Bonnie, you'd like to know if we see a little bird called a Jamison's five finch. Um, we do get them in this area, and usually, funnily enough, Bonnie, and I actually like to show everyone what the Jamison's five finch looks like because it is such a beautiful bird. Let me just get it for you quickly. Um, now, Bonnie, they often found in, <laughs> believe it or not, but in little garden areas and that around lodges, because um, where there's lovely, where there's bits of water and that, and seeds that they can feed on, and little plants that they can hide in, um, they are really, really beautiful little birds. And I will find it. There it is. Actually, let me just tilt it this way for you. And that's the image that you would see in the books, the Jamison's fire finch, but I'll show you a picture of one, a photograph, which is a lot better. Have a look at that. Beautiful little um, reddish pink underneath, um, and slightly, slightly, there we go, slightly brownish wings. Very, very beautiful bird. Let me see if there's a, there's another little picture of one. Some have got little white specks on them at times. But that's the Jamison's Fire Finch. We do get them in the area. Um, I just haven't seen one on Juma though, not yet. But like I said, little garden areas, areas where there's bird baths, food for them to feed on. Um, generally dense little thickets and they fly around between the, the bushes. That's the general habitat of the Fire Finch. Very, very beautiful little birds. approaching the airstrip again so let's have a look if there isn't perhaps something that's come out now into the clearing we do know these side stripe jackal do enjoy the clearings they enjoy these open areas and you do find them around here at times see anything here at the moment unfortunately and just again just to have a look how clear the sky is off to our left oh this breaks clear and you can see the Drakensberg mountain range clearly in the distance. That's what I was saying after this rainfall now everything's settled, the dust is settled, the air, the air is cleared up. It's really really lovely. But it does, it appears as if that mountain range has moved closer because you can see them so clearly. And at times of the year, especially in winter, you have a lot of dust in the air and a lot of uh, uh, not, uh, it's not air pollution, but it just uh, gives the air a very hazy effect. You can sometimes not see those mountains at all. It's incredible what the rain does. It's quite windy out in this clearing around the airstrip. I'm not sure how much rain the DRC did get last night. Um, I think we got between 15 and 20 mils, um, judging from what uh, I've heard other, other guys speaking about. But I'm not exactly sure how, how much rain we got. We'll have to try and find out and see if we can give you all an update this afternoon at how much rain we got last night. Well, as you can see, not much movement here with the Inkahuma Pride. They're still fast asleep. 
I think we're going to probably make our way out of here shortly. Uh, I don't think we're going to see too much action. I'm just waiting to see if they possibly might get moving. But uh, looking at them now, it doesn't look like it. Now, I have heard Madam Amber and what I'm presuming is the authority have also been found. I'm just going to give Byron a call, see if he's closer. Byron, Byron. Oh no, I forgot, Byron's still on Arethusa. <laughs> no, he's still on Arethusa, That's he's on a different radio channel, that was my fault, I wasn't thinking very clearly this morning. <laughs> there we go, doing a little bit of grooming. And as I said, I'm pretty sure they're going to be right here for the sunset safari. Now Anna's wondering, is how can a lion's tongue rasp skin and meat off a carcass but not harm themselves when they're grooming? Well, I collect a lot of that fur while they're using their tongue and also I don't think they lick with quite the same vigor as they would on a carcass. And you see there, you probably find most of what that cub's getting is fur. Now, if you've got a domestic cat at home and you've ever been licked by it, now, you felt how rough, almost like sandpaper, their tongue is. Now, a lion's just a much bigger, uh, harder, more robust version of that tongue. Okay, it sounds like Byron's quite far away, so we are going to start moving and making our way towards whatever else is around. Ooh, I've just got another report. It sounds like it's not only in Fumo. It sounds like there's three males there, so I'm definitely going to head that way. Station with those and guys, I'd like to join you. I'm still quite a long way out though, so if anyone's closer, please go ahead. Okay, now we've got to pick our way out of here. As I said, this is a particularly thick area. Okay, I'm going to turn around. I see a route. I see a route out. been a long time since we've seen three of the Birmingham boys together so it could be quite exciting to go have a look it sounds like there is a kill there in the area as well so let's trundle along and who knows maybe we'll find Queen Karula on the way now of course the lions seem to be making us go from one end of the end of Juma to the other. Those three males in amber eyes are on the far opposite side of Juma. So while we make our way there, uh, Steph is looking at uh, some of the plants we get here on Juma. I need to turn around and walk in the opposite direction. It seems like there are lions everywhere here around us in this sort of arc in front of us. It's awesome. <laughs> but while you've been away with, uh, with others, Stephanie has asked me a question about is there mistletoe and mopani worms here? Um, yes to both questions. There's mistletoe here and uh, many different kinds of mistletoe with the most common mistletoe being the Kalahari mistletoe growing exclusively and at the top of knobthorn trees. The answer to your second question about Mopani worms is also yes, although not as many as you find in the Mopani belt, which lies about from here, probably about 80 to 90 kilometers away north of where we are. The Mopani belt starts and there you find 
large concentrations of Mopani worms. Here the Mopani worms tend to favor jackalberry trees and you do find lots of Mopani worms here on jackalberry trees depending on the year really. Um, I had a look through a jackalberry tree two or three days ago to see if there were any Mopani worms that I could see and it's a little bit early for them. They come out in around about November. You see them tiny little worms like this when they hatch literally just covering the ground in any direction. They move up into the Mopani trees and you can actually sit still on a windless day and you can hear them eating the leaves around you it's just the most surreal weird experience you've had um, and I highly recommend it and of course then by the end of the season around about Christmas time January time the worms are big enough that you can squeeze them out and you can pop them into a pot boil them fry them you could just eat them raw whatever you need to do they are a huge delicacy even sold in the shops here they package them <laughs> dry them and package them and sell them in the shops here that's how many there are all right, we are walking pretty much in exactly the opposite direction to where those lions were called in. Not because we need to worry about lions on foot. I mean, of course you have to worry about lions on foot, but because we will disturb those cats if we walk into that area um, and bump into them. And of course we want to try and get Brent or Brian, or it would be Brent because uh, uh, he's here, Byron's in Arethusa. We'd get Brent and you there as soon as he gets to that sighting. So we don't want to bump into them, we don't want to cause them to run away or run at us. That's not what we want to do. So we're walking in the opposite direction, changed our plan a little bit. Not to worry, any direction over here is pretty much as, as exciting as any other direction here for me, so it's not too much of a concern to be honest. All right, now let's see what this is. Jason, you've asked me an interesting question, one I haven't been asked in many, many years. You've asked, are there sundews in Juma or any other carnivorous plants? Yes, there are. Um, however, I'm just busy trying to rack my brain. There are sundews here. I'm just trying to rack my brain to think if there are any fly traps here um, other than that. No. There's just the sundews that we find here, and we find them deep in summer so from January all the way through to about the end of March and they like these pools still pools and they grow right on the edge of the water they they quite they're water loving plants and so we hopefully we'll be able to show you some from January through to about February or so I don't think there are any other carnivorous plants around at all not that I can think of have a look at this awesome thing here this is the very camouflaged entrance to a massive baboon spider's hole. She must have been living here forever and ever. Look at that. She's managed to stick all these leaves to the entrance of her burrow using silk and just have a look at the diameter of that hole. Now baboon spiders are the South African equivalent of tarantulas. They're our tarantula or megalomorph as we call them and this is the whole of the largest megalomorph that we find out here. This is the entrance tunnel to the golden brown baboon spider. A spider that is bigger than my hand and you can see her next to my face. You'll see that with legs and everything extended this female spider I would presume is this big with an abdomen that thick. One of the massive, most massive of the spiders. The biggest one that we find in this. In this. But what is unique is the fact that this spider over the years has accumulated this camouflaged entrance and is using it to hide herself. Of course tarantulas or baboon spiders that live in holes like this, they when they become adult and they molt from adolescence into adulthood, they actually lose the appendage that they were born with to dig with and so they will live sedentary, the females will live sedentary in these holes for the rest of their lives and they live up to 25 years old. So from very young to they will live in, 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 these, in these holes up to 20 years. Isn't that incredible? 
And of course, if you had to dig her out, even if we were to entice her out and she got lost and couldn't find her hole, she wouldn't be able to dig a new one. And because of her size, moving around at night would be very dangerous for her. She'd, she would be an easy snack for lots of nighttime birds, as well as lots of little nocturnal predators as well. Let's see if you can see her. Now, Wendy, you've asked, can I find you a baboon spider today? This is about as close as we could get to a baboon spider without me having to fish her out of the hole. We could fish her out of the hole. It's relatively harmless to the spiders, and we can see if she'd be partial to being teased out of the hole. Let me just see if I can find... I'll tell you how we do it safely. I won't tease her out of the hole if I can't find the exact piece of grass that I'm looking for. Let me see if I can do it. Here we go. Wait there, I'm coming back to you now. No, that's not it. Because we've had such a... Here we go, let's see if we can use this. So, when you are fishing for baboon spiders, the key to not hurting them is to use as soft a grass as you can. So, I use this end of the grass. No spikes, soft, soft, soft. And the reason for that is that you just want to tease the spider. You want to tease the entrance to the burrow and get the spider to come to the grass. You don't want to get them to grab onto the grass. And if you use a sharp end or you use a stick, quite often as the stick comes sliding down the tunnel, it will bump into the sides and you don't really know what is the baboon spider and what is the side. And very easily you can slip under the baboon spider and you can actually puncture the body of the baboon spider. So, if you're ever going to be fishing for baboon spiders, you always use the soft grasses. It's completely harmless to the spider. It creates no disturbance whatsoever. Let me show you how we're going to do it. You twirl it. And then you stick it into the entrance and you just create a little disturbance. You can see all that silk covering the tips of the grass. That makes it easier to get inside. So now we're creating a disturbance. If the spider is active and it's got a lot to do with ambient temperature, on very hot dry days they are more active, actually evenings really, than they are during the day and if she's active she will come and push out the piece of grass and that is when we get to see her. Well, let's see if she comes. Any other way of fishing out a baboon spider I would recommend against. As you can see her silk has covered the grass tuft and has provided me with a probe that is a little bit more robust but completely soft and so absolutely no danger to her whatsoever. Any other way, any stick, sharp piece of grass, anything, you run the risk of puncturing her and then that's just as deadly to her as anything else. No, she's deep down inside today. She's not wanting to come out and play at all. Generally speaking, as soon as you put it in there, if they are active and they are at the entrance to their burrow, they, she'll come and she'll push out the grass with her front feet and she'll come out to the front where we can see her. But this particular spider on this particular day is dormant. She is resting at the bottom of her hole, probably digesting a big meal. Maybe she caught something big last night. She would have retreated to the end of her burrow, which is about this, this deep. She would have retreated right down to the bottom of her burrow with her prey and she'd be eating it at the bottom of her, of her burrow, meaning she wouldn't need to worry too much about a piece of grass at the entrance. Uh, she could also be on some eggs at the moment. Um, absolutely gravid, but generally if they have got babies, those babies line the entrance to their burrows and you can see all these little baby baboon spiders in the entrance. So we're going to leave her alone. Unfortunately, I couldn't show it to you today. And we're going to carry on with our wanderings over here. See if we can find you another one.
All right, and while we carry on with our wanderings over here, I suppose, and see what other things we can uncover for you in this fantastic day, let me send you all the way over to Byron in Arethusa for an update. And we're still exploring parts of Arethusa, Steph. Um, we're having a good look around to see if we come across anything interesting. Um, nothing just yet. It's been fairly quiet here this morning. But it happens like that at times and it's worth just having a look around and seeing what we can find uh, on our travels. Very surprised we haven't seen more elephant. I really thought we would see some elephant on the side. Watch out. And again, there are just some really beautiful areas, beautiful views from here. Do have slightly high-lying crest areas and just the view from up here is fantastic. If you um, might not be able to see it now, there are a few trees in front of us, but fairly shortly you might get a little opening and I'm sure jean will show you. <laughs> Said he'll think about it. Kingfisher. Yeah, my brakes, I think, scare everything away. But there we go, it's a beautiful woodland kingfisher. Look at that, even in the shade, the color is beautiful. It's hiding from us a little bit. Um, but you can, and there, you go, there it goes. It's sitting just up there, I think. Oh, there are two of them. One just flew into, let's see, sorry, just trying to look and see. The one flew into this marula off to our right. Uh, that's a bit tricky, jean I wonder if that branch isn't in your way. I think it is um, a little bit low down to the left. Yeah, it's in branches in the way. Uh, but yeah, a bit tricky. The other one is still sitting just off to the right over here. Let's see if we can get... There we go. There's the other one still sitting in there. Very secretive little birds. Occasionally you get them sitting right out in the open, no problem. Posing for you and then at times they'll dart in into the th uh, into the trees and disappear very very quickly lovely to see one though glad we got to see one oh dear. A few starlings calling around us. The bird, birds are quite active around here, but oh, uh, caught a of a starling flying over us. It's a bird. Okay, well, we've made it all the way down to the eastern edge of Juma. We were right in the west, and now we're heading north towards where I've heard there's amber eyes and three Birmingham boys. Oh, and now we've got some kudu and some baboons. And warthog. Lots of different animals here. There's that baboon walking away. Hello, little one. 
for those massive ears. I do love kudu ears. Listening to every word I say. Oh, doesn't like what I'm saying. Let's just see if we can get a view of those warthog. Before we continue on towards three magnificent male lions. Where'd that pig go? There it is, it's not being... Oh, disappeared into the bush. Doesn't want to be on camera today, the warthog. Oh, they're running away. Okay, let's continue on towards the lions. Always check for tracks. Now, exciting. We, I don't think we've seen the three Birmingham boys together in a long time. Uh, Tenor was with Nkuma, so maybe he got left behind. Or maybe he's over here and we're missing uh, either Nana or Tsuko. It'll be interesting to see which ones are here now. Oof, I think I'm going to struggle to, to tell the difference between Nana and Tsuko. I haven't seen them in so long. No one else has driven down Cheetah Cut Line yet. I think everyone's coming in from that side. We took the, the short way around. Uh, and on our way here, we actually found a leopard kill. Uh, or well, Aubrey found it. He told us where to look. Now, it's a baby impala. But while they were tracking, uh, that leopard ran south when they saw them and went down into Little Gauri. So hopefully by this evening that leopard will come back now it's not it doesn't look like Karula or the cubs it apparently it's a, it was a male leopard a young male leopard so it could be Sindila it could be a host of other male leopards that might have been moving into the area so who knows fingers crossed we might have a new male on the sunset safari Uh, it looks like the sun is slowly winning its battle with the, with the clouds. And I, I know a lot of you are just as excited as I am to see three big male lions together. Now, as I said, it sounds like there's a kill there. So there could be some uh, fighting over the meat. Well, we'll have to see when we get there. So it should be just up ahead. Station with the Zingalad quarry found coming. Confirm best access is from quarry pan itself. Thanks very much. I'm at uh, Hippo Pools Junction with uh, Chile Cutline now. Okay, so we're a couple of minutes away. Sorry, Stan Boggy! Whoa, off the Stan Boggy goes. Okay. Okay, we're about maybe a minute, 30 seconds. Uh, we'll just see once we get there. Okay, so we're coming up towards Gori Pan. And then we're just gonna go on Hippo Pools for a little bit and then north into the block. Apparently we can see 
the vehicles from the road so it should be right here somewhere it's a big marula I presume it's that one ah there we go I see them So, I'm assuming it's Amber Eyes, I can't think it'd be anyone else, but now, instead of the attentions of one male, it looks like she's got the attentions of three. You've always got to be careful when driving around little round leaf teaks like this because the elephants keep them so short that there could actually be a monster stump inside one of those tiny little bushes. Okay. Okay, we're about... 20 seconds about from seeing what's going on. I can actually just make out the lines through the bush. I was just trying to look for the best route without the stumps. Now it's going to be interesting to see which of the male lions is the lion closest to Amber Eyes. Is it still going to be the authority or has his spot at the top had to be relinquished by one of the other males? Oh, here we go. There's Amber Eyes. And who is that next to her? Immediate growling. Uh, we're going to move now. It's a, a turn around. Is it Infumo? We can't see just yet. It is Infumo. Infumo is still holding his place at the top. And the other males must be beyond. Scent marking. Uh, I can just see the other two boys lying up in the distance. Uh, we will try to get a, a view of them now. Nice big bellies. Can't see where the carcass is just yet. He's trying to find a spot where we can lie between. Amber eyes and the other two males. Here we go. Shielding them, her from them. Okay, well we're going to move around to try see uh, a bit more. Uh, it's going to take a little bit of maneuvering. Let's have a look where we're going to go. Gonna go behind the other vehicles. Oh. Hello, Dale, a brand new viewer. Welcome to the Safari Live family, Dale. Uh, Dale would like to know how do we come up with the animals names and what are they? Well, it all depends uh, Dale. Normally there's a, a process and uh, a vote and we try to choose the different names and uh, in doing that we normally try 
we try to use local Shitsonga or Shanghai names and um, unless there's something very apparent that is not going to work for uh, Shitsonga names and so for example Amber Eyes has got very she's the only lioness in the in Kahuma Pride who's got orange eyes oh there we go let's just make some space here quickly and we can move through and uh, so uh, we don't normally name all the lionesses the males definitely we name them because they develop some really really def definitive characters uh, and, and, and scars and wounds and uh, how's it? Thanks very much. Yeah. Cheers. And uh, and uh, the leopards as well. It's much easier to identify the indiv individual leopards, and uh, it's uh, partly to keep track of them, partly uh, because we see them so often. It'd be silly to call it the, that leopard with the with the two spots here and the one spot there. Uh, there's the kill. There's almost nothing left. It looks like a young buffalo. And let's go have a look at which males are here. Next eyes. Oh, his name is name is Mfumo, the authority. And he is seems to be bigger and more dominant than the other lions, the other male lions that are part of the Birmingham Coalition. There are there are four of them in total. Now, who do we have here? Is it the two missing, or is one of them Tinio? Oh, I'm gonna need some help here. I don't, I haven't seen the other two in so long. Uh, could you be Tinio with your balloon belly? Oh, this is gonna be tough. Uh, let's have a look at the other one there. Oh, that doesn't look like Tinio. So that's either Nena, the warrior, or it's all Goldie or Gold. Oh, and the problem with our blonde or Goldie we was referred to as blondie quite a bit because he had a very blonde mane is that as he got older that obviously that mane's darkened and uh, <laughs> and it is it is a quite a quite a difficult one that's I'm pretty sure neither of these are tenure so this is oh no, one is tenure he rolled over it looked like tenure just zoom in on his face there for me please is it I can't see It looks like it is Tinio. Now Tinio means the tooth. Because he's got a split lip and you can often see his canines through there. We can't really see clearly to make a definitive decision just yet. I'll try and move around a little bit to see his face a bit better. So I'm going to look at the. Remember, trying to remember now. Oh, he's up. Now we need to look at the other side of you. Where are you off to now? It looks like he might be smelling. Uh, possibly amber eyes urinated there. Now Tinio was limping and very stiff yesterday. I, I think this is Tinio. I need to see his left hand side to be sure. More specifically the left hand side of his face. There we go. It is Tinio. You can see that little scar there. Okay, so we've got Mfumo and Tinio, and then I'm not sure who the third one is. A 
Aaron says it looks like it could be Nena. He's got the equal signs on his nose. Okay, well, let's go have a look at Nena's face again. Now, the problem with that, that equal sign scar is that it wasn't a very deep one, so it's not like it's something that will last. I'm trying to remember if they had notches in their ears. Oh dear, this is going to be quite difficult, especially if I'm lying down like that. Anyway, you can definitely see that Stinyo now. You can see the scar on his left lip. Okay, well, hopefully these lions get up and start feeding again shortly. While well, we wait for them to do that, let's go see what Steph's found on foot. I also hope those lions get up and get active for you. I think it's going to be interesting to see today. All three male lions together, it's a Christmas present. <laughs> we don't have something that exciting, but it is interesting nonetheless. We're sitting by a single elephant dropping. It's probably a bull elephant, judging from the size of it. But it is, and I'm talking about a good couple of pounds over here. Have a look at the spread of this. Now, for me, what's interesting about this particular pile of elephant dung is that it's been washed by the rain, but what it does is it gives us such a huge snapshot into why elephants are so important for the environment and why their droppings are so important. Elephants create open areas by knocking down trees and eating them. They don't have a very effective digestive system and that is a good thing because they produce these massive amounts of dung all day basically. Have a look, there's my hand for some scale and just have a look at how big this actually is. It's just an enormous, and this is just a single bolus. The elephant will produce much, much more than this in a day. And it's made up mainly of wood. Now this was a, an elephant bolus that was dropped just before the dung beetles came out to play, otherwise they would have processed this and buried it. So this has been lying here for a few weeks. The rain has now washed it and is starting to disperse it. And all of this is just the most unbelievable compost. You can see how, although it is fairly dry on the outside, the inside is still wet from the rain and any moisture that it can absorb. Termites are starting to introduce sand. There's the termites. That's mud and clay and air into these, into these, uh, into these boluses. There's a dung beetle hole there. There was one here. And this will now catch seeds, grass seeds, plant seeds from bird droppings coming to eat insects out of here. Um, seeds rolling around, airborne seeds, it will catch it. And it just adds such a nice compost bed. And as the rain will start to disperse this, or people like me, We'll start to disperse this. You'll see it'll go over a wider and a wider area. Here's an ori the original part of the bolus here. It's a little bit more tightly packed, this one. And what we were noticing here is, although in the dry season these elephants were eating almost all sticks and leaves, there's a branch, you don't really see a lot of thorns. I mean, I could probably step on this without worrying too much about the thorn, there's a fairly large stick that has been chewed through completely. Let's see if we can find a thorn. Set to challenge. This is a buffalo thorn. You can see that distinct zigzag, but no thorn. The thorns have been rubbed. I suppose it would make sense that they're, that they're Thorns are rubbed blunt or rubbed to nothingness, otherwise they could puncture the intestines. So something else is happening inside an Ellie's tummy, not just the teeth. There's some more sticks. 
still no thorns. And next time you have a view of some elephant with us, just have a careful look at how many thorns they, they do actually eat. But I can... Sleep on it. Yeah, <laughs> VM says we could use it as a mattress, you could sleep on it. I think you're gonna, you'll have a soft bed, but it's gonna make you itch like crazy. I think it's all the creepy crawlies that are inside here. There's another stick, also no, no thorns. And very little insects in this particular bolus. We've seen some dung piles over here that literally, as soon as they fall on the ground, the dung beetles started it. So I think this was probably deposited before any major uh, dung beetle activity started. And there's now fresher pickings, for lack of a better word, for them. So they're leaving this particular pile alone. And there we're starting to see the ground. No, still digging through. Wow. This thing must have weighed... I don't know, 30 or 40 pounds when it came out. What do you think, Vio? It's massive. <laughs> Here's another very well chewed stick. Now, you can actually judge the relative age of an elephant that produced this bolus by having a look at precisely how fine the sticks are chewed. Very old elephant have gone through their, their sixth and final set of teeth and they will start to masticate uh, or chew um, finer and finer material. But when they do have to eat sticks uh, and branches, which is in the dry season, they, they can't chew them as finely. And so you find whole sticks and whole leaves. One of the defining characteristics of a very old elephant dung is the fact that leaves will come out whole. And I suppose then thorns will come out whole as well. This particular elephant dung looks like from a very robust bull elephant. I'm judging it a bull by the size, the sheer volume of dung. And then also these sticks that we're finding over here have been chewed incredibly fine. Except for that one of course, but these, have a look at that, that's easily as an inch wide. Chewed up completely. There's a stick as well, also that's part of a much larger stick. This is our last stick. I want to show you proper branch, being chewed up into tiny little pieces there. <laughs> All right, uh, we're going to move on from our dung pile, and uh, Byron's got some impala to show you. And have a look, we're back finally everyone, we're back on Chuma, um, and we've just come across a wonderful, wonderful herd of impala with so many little lambs at the moment. This is really, really great. I'm going to move forward just very slowly. I'll try to show you, there's a few there, look at that. I'm sure most of these, or quite a few of these, are fairly newborn. Perhaps during the course of the evening with that rain that we had. Um, I'm hoping they don't move off too far. They seem pretty relaxed. And there they come. But there's a number of little young impala lambs around here. Look at that. Isn't that just a wonderful, wonderful sighting? The green grass in the background. These little lambs stumbling about. <laughs> oh, look. <laughs> so cute. You can see already that that one looks a little bit bigger than the other one that just moved off to the right. And it could be just a day or two and it's incredible to see the size difference. Forrest, who's a new viewer, good morning to you, Forrest, and welcome. Great to have you on Safari Live with us. You wanted to know, do the impalas only give birth at one specific time during the year? And that is correct, Forrest, they do. 
but let me tell you what happens. So the rutting season for the impala, the, the, when the males are looking to mate with the females and they fight for dominance is around April, May and usually they mate in May and then it's about a six and a half month gestation period and uh, towards the beginning or beginning and middle of November is when the impala start lambing. That's the lambing season and all of them try and give birth all of them try and give birth around the same time and the reason for that is so that they can keep um, and keep a close eye on all these lambs and try and protect them at, all together. Also what happens is it's basically a, a def, well, not quite a defense mechanism but a survival mechanism. So with all the lambs giving birth at the same or being born at the same time, what happens is the the um, if predators hunt the lambs because they are easy prey and if predators hunt them in a group like this, for example, we've got 10, 15 or 20 lambs, if 5 or 10 die or are caught by predators, there's still 10 or 15 that survive. So that's why the impala are so successful. And that is why we see so many of them in these areas. So that's generally the impala lambing season. However, um, there is a second rut which occurs, um, if I'm not mis mistaken, I think it's around July, August, somewhere around there. Um, and then that could cause a few late births around... Um, of uh, February, March, somewhere around there, you might see one or two lambs. It doesn't happen that often, but it does occur, and, and that's purely because females may not have been covered c properly during the mating season, during the rut in May and June, sorry, in uh, April, May, and then uh, there will be a second rut where the males try and cover those females that are not pregnant later on. But generally, it's one breeding season, and, um, and that's why we are seeing so many lambs around at the moment. Very, very nice sighting. That's lovely. Well, I'm glad we did get to see some animals moving around eventually. We were struggling a little bit this morning, but that's the way it goes. Especially when you go off exploring, you don't really know what, to f what you're going to find. Ah, now we're going to leave this impala and see what else we can find, but Brent is still with those beautiful male lions. As the link started, Amber I stood up, so we're just moving towards her. There we go. Is she trying to get back to the rest of the pride? And Fumo is keeping a very close tab on her. Oh, she's definitely had a good feed on that buffalo. They all have by the looks of things. What you up to, madam? Are you just going to lie down again? Too hot to do anything. Mm, flop! I thought she might move towards the carcass, but I don't think she can fit much more in her belly at the moment. Now, that other male line is still a mystery. I'm not sure whether it's Nena or Tuku, but um, it's one of those things. I mean, I haven't seen them in so long. They could have got lots of new scars uh, and nicks and whatnot, so we're gonna have to have a closer look, but it's quite difficult when they're lying down. Oh, and look at this. That's just I've got a little friend. Okay. Oh, I did used to know the name of this moth. Well, apparently, um, our final control have seen him. He's been with us for quite some time. He was even driving with us. Very pretty little moth, very hairy. 
I wonder if you are one of the moths that spawned the hairy caterpillars that attacked me. Hmm. Naughty, naughty. Anyway, well, I'll leave them there. Now, the amazing thing is, so we've been sitting here quite quietly. We're the only people with the lions at the moment. And uh, we could hear another creature moving around the lions. And I'll just see if I can get to a spot where we can see it nicely. Now, oh, it's amazing. They've already... In, the, in, the, in five minutes, they've disappeared. Oh no, there's still some out, but as the sun's getting stronger and stronger, they are going to disappear. And I think it's that branch there. No? Yes, it is. No, is it? There we go. Look at them. We can actually hear the termites cutting up the dried wood and the dried leaves and taking them back down. Isn't that incredible? You can see the soldiers with their massive pincers standing guard. Now, these termites are not harvested termites. Uh, they look like macromides. My termites are a bit rusty. So, you can see they are almost translucent. You can see straight through them. So, they're actually in danger from the sun. And the sun will burn them. And that's why generally you only really see them at night or in the early morning out on the open, in the open foraging. And you can see the soldiers standing guard with those massive red heads on the edge of the walk worker's route in case any foul play happens, in case there's a bird or, or, or any other creature that decides to try to eat them. Now, there's a lot less of them than there were earlier. Scuttle, scuttle, scuttle. And down they go. Oh, we've got some action behind us. And Fumo is up. See, it's not always about the massive lions. Even when we're next to massive lions, we spot the little creatures. Oh dear. That is probably the worst reason to f go to a lion who's standing up. And the wind is blowing from him to us. Oh gee, wah. Oh my goodness, that smells horrible. Oh, no, we're moving. We're moving. We need to get out of the direct wind line. Wow. Fuff. That was quite impressive, Mfumo. Let's just try to get to a spot where we're not in that direct sort of breeze. Um, <laughs> Hi, a new witchy who's a, a brand new viewer, another new viewer. Great to have you on Safari Live. Sorry about that. I needed to get away from that oh, disgusting smell. Uh, just see, has he moved again? What's he up to? Oh, he's gone back to sleep. Um, new witchy is wondering uh, about coalitions and uh, how many lions are in a coalition or how many lions are in a pride. It's, a, it's a always in flux, so uh, generally a very big pride in this area will be 10 adult females. Oh. Uh, 10 for adult females. I've seen prides in this area with more, much more than that. But uh, coalitions vary quite a lot as well. And he's just lying down next to Amber Eyes, making sure his body is positioned between her and the other, other males. So the Nkuma Pride currently is five adult females and uh, six cubs. Now, those cubs are around six months old, or just a, some of them a little bit younger. And uh, it's they've still got a, a, a tough sort of six, seven months ahead. Until they're about a year old, and there's always a, a very high mortality rate in lions, um, up to 50% in this part of the world. 
and uh, so the pride numbers fluctuate constantly and so do coalition numbers now the Birmingham boys were originally five male lions uh, one unfortunately got killed by a wound suffered in a buffalo hunt he got a lung punctured by a buffalo horn but there we go. Uh, so the Birmingham boys, and generally, but generally, once they're established in a in an area, it's unusual for a coalition member to die as early as as that one did. Normally, they'll be established for four or five years, and coalitions can range from two to the biggest I've heard of, eight. So it all depends. And quite often, they're not always related males, and they're not always of the same age. But by forming a coalition, they are able to dominate a larger area. So the Birmingham boys, for example are lord over three different prides. The Nkahuma pride, who we've seen this morning, and this lioness here is part of the Nkahuma pride. Uh, the Styx pride, who we see from time to time, uh, the, and the Torchwood pride, who we've actually never seen on a live drives. So there we go, that's who the, the three prides that we know about the Birmingham's being in charge of. But I'm pretty sure they're all gonna be here on the Sunset Safari. So lions, lions everywhere. And hopefully we'll find out who that young male leopard or that male leopard that ran away from Aubrey on foot is if he returns to retrieve his impala carcass. So we're gonna leave these lions, head to find ourselves some breakfast. Hopefully it smells a bit better than what's deposited behind us. But we will see you in a few short hours for the Sunset Safari. And uh, it's Khat's last drive. so. We're going to say goodbye to him. I'm sure he'll be back again at some point. There we go. Big nod. Oh, a very pretty, pretty daylight moth. Oh, has landed and taken off in a matter of seconds. It was a little burnet. Uh, oh, no, sorry, a forester moth. Well, I'm sure we're going to see a few more of those. But for the last few minutes, let's go back across to Byron. Uh, Brent's had a lot of luck with the lions this morning. That's fantastic. And I do think they will still be around this afternoon. So hopefully we'll get to see them. And like Brent says, maybe a leopard too. That would be great. It's been an interesting morning for us, exploring around and oh, some squirrels. Let's see if we can get that little squirrel quickly. Uh, there it is. Oh, dear. <laughs> little tree squirrel just running off very, very quickly. Um, and nice to see those elephants early on this morning. I'm very glad that we did get to see them. But um, we'll hopefully try for some more creatures this afternoon and more animals. And we'll see what we can do. But from myself and from Jandre on camera with me this morning, thank you very much. Hope you've all enjoyed it. Let's head over to Steph and he can say goodbye. I heard such an interesting story about this grass. Oh, let me just pick this grass. This is a piece of carrot seed grass. And I was told that this grass is the inspiration for Velcro. The person who invented Velcro was looking at this grass, looking at the way that it stuck to your socks, and decided to come up with a concept of Velcro from this grass. How true that is I'm not too sure although these are very sticky seeds and they do have a very velcro-y type look to those hooked spines that each grass seed has and of course they're designed to hook into fur and to be transported from one place to another where they basically just stick to everything every piece of your sock they get into and they get into your shoes and they create blisters one of the reasons why i wear these coverings on my shoes is for these types of seeds they are just at that angle that they would bash against your sock and go into your shoe as those three seeds have just fallen in there now you take them out before they do cause an issue and that's why i wear these coverings to keep the grass seeds out. And I've got a thorn that's... So you pick up all these passengers while you're walking around here in the bush. Thorn embedded in my leg. One of those things, you know. <laughs> it's just been such an epic day today. We've had lion, 
those three male lions lying together and Kahuma Pride back on track again. There's just tracks everywhere and it rained last night. Probably didn't do too much. I'd, we're looking at some pans and some puddles that we've, we have around the place where we've been walking today and they've all been pretty shallow. I mean, this depression for instance is holding no water whatsoever. And it should hold a little bit of water after rain like we had yesterday. At the moment it's just got some mud in it. I don't think we had more than five millimeters of rain yesterday at all. Which is actually okay to be honest. Now, David, I, um, you just said why did I say we have to avoid puddles of water? Um, I can't remember saying that David, I think we need to see puddles of water, I don't think that, uh, that, um, that uh, we need to avoid them at all. Um, in actual fact when you're driving quite the opposite, it's quite often the best thing to drive through puddles, you don't make these wide roads around puddles, but you've got to do it slowly because quite often the puddles out here are home to a bunch of different frogs and terrapins and beetles and they need to get out of the way of the cars really. Walking through puddles, you could do that but you know wet socks and wet shoes, they're not my favorite thing. They won't give you any more blisters or any less blisters unless you've got sand in. But, um, and it's always the best thing to try and keep socks in that dry when you walk out here. But yeah, no, you don't have to avoid puddles David. You can walk through and jump in as many puddles as you like. Let's go and have a look at this marula tree. Well, we're coming to the end of the show so your look at this marula tree is probably just going to be at looking at how big it is. <laughs> but from our side, from myself and VM and from the rest of the crew, and Brent was out this morning along with Gert and John Ray and all the FC ladies. We just want to say thank you very, very much for all your support. Remember to keep on watching. We'll see you this afternoon. Wherever you are in the world, have a good day.